Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Giluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello guys, I'm Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe, bringing you another episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. I'm excited and energized about this one, not only because it's going to talk about my area, you know, in terms of uh, where I get my bread, real estate, but because I have a very, very exciting, energetic guest, young guest, who is really comparatively new in real estate, but we're going to discuss the do's and don'ts. But before I introduce her, I implore you, no, I plead, I request, I don't know, you put any word you want, but I'm asking you please to strike that uh, subscribe button. We need your support, we need to get the numbers high, we need to, you know, deal with these algorithms that are always changing. So guys, please press that subscribe button. Uh, my guest uh, is Penyom Pizze. Would you care to uh, give a longer introduction, but most importantly... Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets. Thank you, Mr. Mohobe. First of all, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be here. Thank you for calling me onto the show. Um, my name is Penyum Pizzi. I am a registered professional in real estate, particularly on the estate agency field, valuation and property management. I have about uh, seven years of experience. So I'm not a newbie. Mm -hmm. The company is recently registered, but myself, I've been practicing for very long. Okay. Um, Seven years is, is, is uh, quite respectable. And uh, tell us about your training, professional training. Um, I studied with Baisaho University. I got my BCom in real estate management. I finished uh, 2018. And I am currently looking to undertake uh, a business management, a become in a master's in business administration, sorry, from the University of mm -hmm. Eton, Eton Business School. Okay, what attracted you to real estate? Um, I'm not going to say I've been loving it since a very young age, I'd be lying. I actually got to know about real estate when I was applying to go to university. I initially wanted to study commercial law, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Mm. Yes, the intake was already closed for UB, and I think it was offered by GU, and I had wanted to go elsewhere. So. My family and friends advised that I try real estate. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with the program as time went on and mm -hmm. I never left. I Did you pursued. start with a certificate and then diploma and then degree or you went straight to the degree? I actually started with a diploma. I was at the university in, in Francistown. Mm -hmm. And then I proceeded to do my BCom here in Khabaroni, mm -hmm. 2016. Okay. Yes. Now, I, I asked you what, what, what attracted to real estate, and um, I guess the other way of asking it, what is it about real estate that you love so much? Um, I love agency mostly. I love helping people settle. I love putting families into homes. I love helping them buy their investment properties and helping them buy their single family housing. Mm -hmm. So it puts joy to me having to hand over keys to a family that will stay there for as long as, as they can, really. Mm. Yes. And uh, after school, what, 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 what jobs in real estate did you get? I went 
straight to after I concluded my BCom in real estate 2018, I worked for Apex Properties, but I had practiced prior to that. So when I went to Apex Properties, I had I had about two years of experience. I was practicing as a student, so I've always an been intern involved. Of some kind. Not an intern. I was doing oh. part time. Oh. Yes. So I've always practiced even when I was a student. So when I left school, I knew what to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I practiced um, valuations. That's where I started. I, 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 try, I started valuations with Roscoe Bonnet back in 2015 with the Francis Town branch. And then when I came here 2016, while I was still schooling, I did estate agency with uh, Belfort Properties, Tony and Glebe. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in, in, in terms of what you actually did, um, what were you doing at, at, at Apex? Um, at Apex, I only did estate agency. Mm -hmm. Yes, no valuation, no property management. At, at Belfort, I did property, I did estate agency and property management. Okay. And then after I left, Apex Properties 2020, and then went to Applebee's, okay. where I did estate agency. A lay person may be watching this, not knowing the difference between these different categories. Can you take us through each one of them? Agency, management, what it entails? Okay, agency is selling and buying. Yes, you help. We help um, property owners sell their properties, those looking to sell, or we help them rent out their properties, be it commercial, industrial, or residential. I deal with all categories. And there's also investors. We help all buyers and sellers. And then the other one is... Uh... And then there's property management. That's when now you, you become a middleman between the tenant and the property owner. Whenever there's a dispute, you handle disputes, you do, you facilitate maintenance, you bring in the maintenance guys, that's property management. And is there another category? I've heard people talk about brokerage. What brokerage. Is that? Mm. Brokerage, really being a broker is the middleman. Mm -hmm. Being a broker is being a middleman for property owners and property um, so what's the difference people. between brokerage and agency, if there's it's, a difference? It's actually the same thing. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, because an agent is also a middleman, mm -hmm. and a broker is a middleman as well. Okay. You're just coming in between a property owner and someone who wants to buy or rent the property. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you have a company called Penny Properties. I do. Before we talk about it, why Penny? What does that mean? Um, I've had people call me Penny, so it came from there. Mm -hmm. I thought of pizza properties and then I was like, uh, mm. pizza properties. It kind of sounded interesting at first, but with time I decided Penny. What about Peño? I did not want to use my name. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. No, that makes sense. So when was it incorporated, P Penny Properties? Uh, it was registered, I think, June. But it started mm -hmm. operating in October mm -hmm. 2021. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And, and what really motivated it? What motivated you to say, I've worked for others, now it's time? Uh, I haven't really been a yes woman, so I had problems with management everywhere I go. Not that I was disrespectful or whatever, I just, when I feel there's a better way of doing something, I prefer to just jump on it than having to go back to management and ask for permission. And that always kind of delayed me with 
decision making, especially when I'm in the field, I have to do something, I always have to go back and say, sir, is it fine if I do one, two, three? Because, you know, working under someone, you always have to make sure you follow the system. So having to introduce new things or taking decisions onto your own without speaking to management first can come off as disrespectful. Are there any particular instances, without mentioning names, where that became manifest? I, yes, there is one. Um, I think it was back in 2019. Okay, let me not mention the year because then you trace it back to where I was. Yeah. But I've already mentioned the year. So mm. it happened once that I was at work on site. Uh, a client wanted to, okay, it's where I worked, they micromanaged everything. Okay, <laughs> it's, mm. it's really going to give you who exactly I worked for, so I have? do not want to talk about the instance. What, was it so bad that they were dictating what they, you should have for They lunch? micromanaged everything. Mm. Yes, you, when you go out, you have to say who you are going to meet, you have to say where you're going. If you change courses, like where you're going, you'd have to say, it where, like you'd have to send a message that you're going elsewhere after. But that's only know. reasonable. I'm sure you ask the same of your employees. Yes, no, I, I, I really don't do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as an agent, you have to, you have to be free spirited when it comes to work. If a client says, there's another property that I want us to go to at outside Kaburoni, say maybe Ramozwa. You have to be able to, to, go, and to go and get the mandate. You know, you have to, you have to mm. flow with the client. Okay. You can't always go back and ask for permission. Okay. Yes. Now, in terms of your decision to go alone, what were... Um, what were the aha moments since you... What I've, were what? What were your aha moments? What were your surprises once you went on your own? Um, I loved that I do not have to report back to anyone. You know, when I have to do something or when I have to travel, I just ask my my team to handle something for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I decide instantly. So I found that very relaxing for me. <laughs> very liberating. Yes. And uh, let's talk about the different um, categories of real estate. Which one are you most comfortable in? Speaking of, you know, uh, um, residential, multi-residential, you know, industrial and commercial. I'm most comfortable with residential, single family dwellings. But um, life has taken me to commercial. That's where I close most deals. Okay. Wh yes. Why are you comfortable more in, in houses? It's, it's less complex. You know, when a family comes to you and they tell you, I want a three bed, modern finishes, and a bigger plot size, and this is my budget. Mm. A specific plot size, and this is my budget. But with commercial they'll let they'll tell you we want to be at a specific location like they'll say maybe g west we're looking for a warehouse of this measurement this is our budget it has to have this many parking spaces it has to have a three-phase what what or the, the, there are many requirements but I mean, it's not as simple as residential mm. you know starting a business or relocating your business and having to situate a company, there's a lot on that checklist. What about um, industrial and multi-residential in terms of categories? Um, industrial, I haven't really been doing many of those, but I've closed residential, I've closed just quite a few industrial mm. deals. Okay. And multi-residential, I do not have a problem with. Yeah, we're now getting into a period which hopefully is post-COVID. 
how is the property market now? What is the state of the market in general? Um, during COVID, the, the hiccup we've experienced with banks on sales is that now the scrutiny is a bit intense. You know, it's not like back then, now they have to look at your contract and see if you won't be retrenched anytime soon and see if the company is not looking to, you know, make any cutbacks and see if they've made any cutbacks. You know, just try to project to, to, to see if your work is stable, if you'll be there for the next, say, 20 years of the mortgage period. And, you know, that, that takes a while from the banks. They now take up to, they can now take up to a month, a month and a half. But back then, they used to take like 14 days and then they'll give you your letter of undertaking. Okay. So, so uh, how is it now? Is it improving or they're, they're still very strict? I found with some of the banks, I nearly pointed them out, but uh, they now um, impose restrictions from the headquarters which are normally outside the country. For instance, they take into account management, they take into account vacancies, they take into account even taxation and other things in valuing a property. Mm -hmm. So you find a property which was previously valued five million, they cut it down a little, down to three million. Has yes. that been experience? Yes, that is just one of the hiccups we're experiencing. And you know, with property owners, it's always a problem for us agents when we're trying to sell because they come to you with a valuation, yeah, 1.5 million. And when you try and explain to them that you cannot, you cannot now get 1.5, it's cut back to 1.3. The market can only, you know, absorb that much. It, it kind of looks like we're just trying to sell off the properties for peanuts. Mm. So we find ourselves having to rub bags with the property owners in that regard. And how do you deal with that uh, reluctant buyers or reluctant sellers? You know, we try and guide them through giving them mm. comparables, you know, what we've sold at and mm. what others are selling at mm. on the market of similar properties, of course, similar okay. properties, similar location. And some of them come around, but some never do. Mm. Just some are just adamant on getting what the valuation says, and some are even requesting for more than what the valuation says, mm. thinking, you know, it has appreciated in value. Some property deals can be nightmares, others can be very, very sweet. True. Take me through a nightmare scenario you've experienced, and then after that we'll deal with the good ones. Um, the nightmare scenarios I've experienced is mostly when I was dealing with um, transactions where the couple is divorcing. Because in that case, you'd have to deal with the husband's lawyer and the wife's lawyers. So it's, it's very tiring and slow, you know, because whenever something happens, they have to notify the lawyers of both parties for us to to get a go ahead if if there's for instance say okay say the the transaction has sailed up to deeds registry mm -hmm. but something is discovered at the deeds say um, for instance there's a payment that has to be made. That so is the, a bond? No, it's not a bond. Mm. It's, it's a bond, yes. Mm. The, 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 the transaction is being bonded. It's been bought through the bank. the bank. But say it's now at the deeds registry, but the deeds registry returns the transaction. And there's an amount that has to be paid. It happens. Mm -hmm. Say it has to be paid because of a penalty. Maybe you have sold the property before 10 years, 
or before five years, according to the title deed. Some properties you have to actually hold the, the plot for a particular period of time before passing it on to someone. So say you, it has been passed on to someone before the stipulated time. If deeds registry recognizes that, they'll return the transaction for you to pay that amount and then mm. they can proceed. Yes. So having to deal with a transaction where it's, it's a divorce it's four, case. It's four people involved, the two lawyers yes. and the two the couple. It's very tiring. And then there's, and there's me. there's hostility between the two. Yes, and then there's me, you know, having to make sure that all information is sent to the mm. people on time so that we can have a more timely response. It's it's very mm -hmm. tiring. So in that do you regard. end up giving up or you end up persisting? No, what I, I, I don't give up. I just push. You mm -hmm. know, it's a test on my side as well. Mm -hmm. If I fail to facilitate such a transaction, what does it say about me mm -hmm. as, you know, as an agent? Mm -hmm. So having to actually succeed on the the difficult transactions says something about you as an agent mm, mm. especially when now the the buyer and the seller are just rubbing heads and mm. you, you have to come in as the bigger person and so do you try find and that you have to be situation. more or less a counselor or, yes. or do a little bit of counseling and, and yes do a little bit of services. litigation and you mm. know try and make sure that mm. the situation doesn't get out of control no court involved okay so then let's uh, switch the pendulum now to where things work out beautifully give examples of those experiences um cash deals they are the most swift mm. um you get a transaction, you get a cash buyer, you go straight to to the lawyers, you sign, they go to the deeds registry and... Cash deals but through the bank? No, I mean... Direct, like direct somebody signs, cash deals. Signs a fact check. Is someone who's just signing a check or has the money there and, mm. you know, they're the most soothing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there plenty of those in this kind no. of market? That's, there are not plenty of those. Yes. Just... Just a handful. Few and far between. Yes. Okay. So, what challenges would you say you've encountered um, in general uh, in setting up in business beyond just the COVID environment? Um, start up. Mm. I started with nothing. Not even money to rent an office. I started off with zero. And from October to January, I had to work from home so that I can try to situate myself better. You know, I, I did not save. I did not save up 100000 or whatever. So for me, I had to work from home for, for like four months, that period of time, so that I can try raise funds and situate myself in an office where I can now call in my clients and get to you know be in an office environment so start up was was a problem for me mm. yes how did you overcome that like i said i was working from home so it allowed me but to i guess i guess i'm asking you how how, how you made what deal rescued you and how did you manage to make the money okay i've always had clients call me for the properties asking me to sell asking me to rent out but mostly it was property rentals that got me out of my hole so i get a property rentals are just you know quick deals mm. so those got me out of my hole i was able to rent an office i was able to brand myself not as much as I want, but yeah, I was able to get somewhere, mm. yes. What techniques and tips can you share with newbies? In other words, what, what, what are your techniques, your secret sauce, so to speak? Um, you need to be well connected. You need to know, you can't just leave work to start your own company without people who are going to call you to rent out or sell their properties. So you need to leave with at least 
five to ten mandates at least mm. actually ten to twenty mm. <laughs> for you to actually start up yes but how do you make a sale can you give an example of the tactics you use advertising marketing you know putting yourself out there so that you are noticed mm. so yeah once you put yourself out there you advertise your properties people come to you to buy to rent out you know there's always someone looking to mm. to move or what, to buy what do you say are the unique challenges for for the botswana market that you've seen or or have to deal with uh, I would say lack of knowledge on both sellers and buyers. Uh, some people do not know the sale process at all. And you have to, you know, with our environment now, sometimes you're just running around doing this and that at the same time. You do not have the time to sit down a client and say this is where we're starting and this is where we're going to end. So you find yourself having to take them through the process as it happens. And as some things happen, clients get, you know, they raise eyebrows at, ah, this is supposed to happen. Why not this instead of that, you know? So it kind of it's kind of a challenge, really. Um, what about the, the, the outside Khaboroni? Are you involved in the market outside the Khaboroni area? And what um, special challenges exist there? I am involved with outside properties, but just neighboring Khaboroni. Mm. Like your Odi, Matebeleng, Mupani, Muchudi. I've tried Francistown, but, you know, distance and everything, I always have to get an agent there to do, to facilitate the viewings and do stuff for me on my behalf. Mm. So sometimes it's, it's, it gets to them doing things without my no, and I've decided to just do away with Francis Town and other areas at the moment until I have someone who can come in and actually do the work on my behalf, truly do the work on my behalf mm. and not go behind my back. And do what? And close the deal without mm. my knowledge. Okay. How serious is that issue, the issue of trust, the issue of backstabbing? How serious is that issue in this it's, industry? It's it's happening it's it happens a lot mm. hence i shy away from doing joint ventures because you take another agent to your house especially when it's an open mandate you take another agent to your house next thing you know they're contacting the owner without your knowledge and they're closing a deal without your knowledge so i shy away from doing joint ventures especially for open mandates as i said but when it's a sole mandate mm. i'd gladly give you the floor to do whatever you have to do with my property all right you 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 talked about knowledge or lack of knowledge in the market and indeed the good book says my people perish for lack of knowledge what are you doing to uh to educate the market and deal with that knowledge gap um I was looking to, I haven't really started, but I am in talks with a particular, maybe I'm now exposing my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was in talks with a particular headmaster of a school. I'm trying to get them to buy properties through me on surrounding areas. So I'll be going there to to school the teachers on what to do and what not to do and just the right ways to really come about when you want to buy. And in your view, what are the biggest mistakes about which people need to really be educated? Um, 
I would say buying, maxing out what the bank can give them. Never, ever, ever buy, like, if the bank says they can give you for 2.5 million, never take 2.5 million. Buy below what they can give you so that you give yourself room, you know, to breathe. Don't take 2.5 million and pay a, a repayment of 20,000. Take less so that you actually pay less and give yourself room for whatever. And, and what are the consequences if you max up? What happens? What are the? If you max out, if you take the whole loan, what happens? What can happen? It, it, it strains them in most cases. You know, they, you, ha you get to pay two point, you get to pay like 17,000 on a mortgage while you could have taken a less property and paid 12 and then have financial flexibility Yana, for whatever situations that may arise because you never know what might happen in a year or two and taking your max also puts you at a higher repayment repayment plan mm. let's take an example with with 10,000 let's say that is your your salary what is the advisable amount that you can put towards a mortgage? Um, if, you if your salary is 10,000, the bank will not give you a repayment of 10,000, of course. They will look into your, your running costs. Okay, running costs are a business. Okay, they'll look into your, your expenses. Your expenses, yes, thank you. Mm. They'll look into your expenses if you have children, if you're repaying your car, if like your groceries, your everything, your hair, your maintenance. They'll look into all that and give you at least a certain percentage. Let's talk about ten thousand. If you're earning ten thousand, how much room do you have? I'd say you should take you should want to pay at least 4000 of mm -hmm. that to a mortgage. It seems because to me you're saying 40%. Yes. So that's a good marker. Yes. Uh, whereas your max would be 60%. Yes. So but from that 60%, remember, you have to take care of other things. In other words, you, the bank might say, no, take a mortgage where you'll pay 6000 a month. So you're left with only 4000 pula. So your advice, if I understand... No, I'm saying take a mortgage for 4000 and be left with at least 6000 No, that's exactly what I'm saying. So yes. other people, what you're saying people should avoid is taking a, a mortgage that you pay out 6000 a month. Or 8000 a month, yeah. yes. Do people do that? You know, people tend to get their max. Mm. Yes, they give us... I can we see those... Uh, pre-approval and financial references. Mm. So they come to us with that reference from the bank to say, you qualify for 1.5. And they say, find me a house for 1.5. Mm. Yeah, that's huge. Any other mistake um, that you think is common about which you want to educate these headmasters and their children? <laughs> always go to your bank and find out what you qualify for before coming to us. So most buyers run around, the moment they get permanent and pensionable, they just start looking to buy. You know, they start shopping around before they actually get to understand what they qualify for. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, I advise my clients to go to the bank first so that we can work on what the bank can give them. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's often people say uh, that you can't go wrong with property. I, I say to my students that you can go spectacularly wrong. Yes. What is your view? Well, this common saying, you can never go wrong with property. My view is that you can go wrong with property, especially when you buy your first house and stay in it. Myself, I would advise buy a house and then get someone else to to repay the loan for you you know do not do not buy a house and stay in it and then pay for the house with your salary 
get a house, get someone else to pay for it, and then go stay in a relatively cheaper house. Mm. Yes. Do not. Uh, are you uh, is that the Kiyosaki school of thought, or there's a lot more to it than that? Because I've read that from Kiyo, Robert Kiyosaki he, on rich dad, poor dad, and cash flow quadrant. Are you familiar with those books? I have. I have tried to read <laughs> mm. Robert Kiyosaki, but um, I never really got myself to finish it. Okay. I'm not big on books. Yeah. Yes. Where do what what do you where do you source your information? I listen to podcasts, mm -hmm. but I've just started listening to yours, of course. <laughs> I listen to mostly Nicolette Mashile. Most of my knowledge I got from her. Tell me about her. She's a financial literacy bunny, really. She, she teaches about financial literacy and mostly real estate. And Do you not a, she's know? She's available for where? On YouTube, she's written books. She is based in South Africa. Oh, okay. All right. So I think for somebody who might not know, um, you need to really guide them as to the process. For instance, once you've bought that first property, how do you go about climbing that property ladder and getting the second and then the third, growing in property? Do you have some advice? Okay, the best way to do it uh, so that you have room to release equity in the long run is to not pay back the loan in the 20 years that the company, that, that the bank has given you. Always try to put money to the bank when you get some. You know, try, if, if the bank says they can give you 20 years to repay the loan, do not pay it in 20 years. Aim for 10 if you can, or 15 if you can. It helps you cut back on the interest you're supposed to pay, and it also gives you, it helps you take home less. Mm -hmm. mm. So, uh, so how do you do that? I mean, uh, I think you have to start teaching now. <laughs> Um, it's just a matter of, you know, if, if you have, if you're an employee, if you have a salary, just get like a small business, mm -hmm. do like a side hustle that will help you generate more money that you can dedicate to putting back to your loan okay. so that you pay it back in less than 20 years. Okay. Are you a property investor yourself? Not yet, mm -hmm. but I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why not? I, I find a lot of estate agents are not property investors. I've always wondered why. Uh, I think it's really not by choice, mostly. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, we're getting peanuts. Mm -hmm. But you get so, large commissions, 5% of yours. <laughs> Don't you? It's, it's not that big. It's, it's what not percentage that, is it? It's 5%, but... It's, it's really not that much money. Mm. Yes, but I'm getting on it. Okay. Yes, I'm on the process of getting my first plot, multi-residential, and slowly by slowly and surely I'll be building okay. from my pocket. I think mostly it's because why agents are not really property owners mostly is because you know banks don't really recognize us as being able to pay back in terms of job security. They prefer someone who has a salary and has, you know, a steady thing going so on. So they think your so income is not predictable. It's, yes, it's not predictable. It's, it's back and forth. So some months you get something, a month you don't get anything. What can so be done about the bank that? needs consistency. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, is there anything that can be done about that to get around that problem? It's building from your pocket, mm. which can be very tiring sometimes. To start. But yes. But once you've done your once first once you've one. built your first project, then mm. you can go to the bank and put it as collateral for a loan and get yeah. you know your second house. Okay. Yes. You mentioned a very big word earlier, equity release. Some of our listeners don't know what that is. Do you want to explain? Um in layman terms it's really getting 
money from your I can you say you're paying for a mortgage and then with time it, it was let's say the mortgage was 1.2 and then with time your mortgage gets to say 400 what is left at the bank then you can get depending on what your property is valued for then say now it will be 1.3 the bank can decide to give you the balance of that, but not to the max, you know, mm -hmm. a certain percentage of it. That's basically equity release. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's talk about uh, creating a good team. This is something that you believe is very important. Tell us how you go about it. I, I do believe it's important. It's very important, you know, for a business to have a good team in place it it creates business continuity and you know a stable business it's the foundation of a business really your employees are the forefront of the war so uh going about it you don't need to have an in-house team on everything you know you can have you can outsource services such as your designers, your photographers, sometimes for other stuff. Like we've so done here with this team. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are they in-house? No, no, they are outsourced. Yes, yeah. so great. So you don't need to have people working for you 24-7. You can outsource some of the services. It's just important to have people you know you can go to when you need something. They are part of your team. Although they're not in your office 24-7, it's your team. How do you cultivate reliability and loyalty among the team? Uh, myself, I've tried to... I'm introducing a system where I give my agents commission on everything they do. You know, be it... I, I get it, we don't have a full team yet. Mm. So some of the things we do ourselves, like designing and everything, we do ourselves, photography and everything. So I give them commission on everything they do, from listing to getting a mandate to uploading it on our platforms to doing the lease agreement to everything. So I try and give them commission on not only when they close a sale, but on everything they do. Okay. Now. So that is just something that other companies are not doing. I hope they don't do it now. Yeah. So it is helps there a particular retain. number that you believe should be given to them? For instance, if you get a 5% on a deal transaction, out of that 5% that you get, let's say it's 1 million, that deal, 5% would be... 50,000, for argument's sake. Yeah. Why out percentage of that do you then give the employees? As per the REB and REC mm. regulations, it's 60-40 mm -hmm. when an agent is registered. So we use that. So the employee gets 40? And the company gets 60%. Okay. Not necessarily... But, but are you not also paying a basic salary and also covering... Uh, disbursement, by that I mean running around costs? I cover disbursement only. Mm. I do not pay a salary. I cover your airtime and petrol if you have a car. Mm -hmm. So I, all my agents are commission based. I'm planning on providing a car because there is a particular lady that I have mm. really, that has really, you know, won my heart. Mm. So I'm working on getting her a car mm. so that she can do the running around with it. And still give her the 60-40 yes. split. Yes, yes. Okay. Hopefully um, other estate agents are taking notes. I hope not because that's just the way I get to retain my... <laughs> that's just the way I get to oh, retain okay. my, my agents. You don't want now them. they get to retain theirs as well. <laughs> I'll not get a lot of applications <laughs> from them. No, it, uh, yeah, okay. So. All right. Um, you say it's important to reinvest. What are you reinvesting? Your profits. Mm -hmm. Always put back something into the business. Not all of it? 
No, as a woman, you have to maintain a certain look. Mm. <laughs> There's way That's There's the investment. Care. Yes, it's yes, but I'm talking about investing into the business, mm -hmm. not on my personal image. Of course, I'm the aren't, company and aren't you the most important uh, I asset? Am. I guess it makes okay. sense if you put it that way. Okay. But yeah, I always I always advise to put back. Let's money. say your profit for On that month is hundred thousand. How much should be reinvested into the business? If it's hundred thousand, mm -hmm. ninety thousand. Why? Ten thousand goes to me, mm -hmm. just to make sure I so look grooming. the part. Yes. Okay. What are you doing with the ninety? You know, branding, marketing, just to provide a proper image so that when people come to you they have like they, they come at ease and they see that you know this is professional professional it's not just fly by night fly by night or a small tech shop mm, you know yeah. people seem to be more comfortable when they come to a presentable area like mm -hmm. for instance <laughs> like CBD yeah. and I towers okay Whatever. Okay. Yes. Now, in terms of um, other startups, where is the mistake they're doing uh, with regard to this advice, investing or reinvesting or not investing? Uh, the mistake I've made is that I wasn't reinvesting right. on, the early, on, on the early months of business. Mm -hmm. So I got money and I chowed money. Mm. So that's the number one biggest mistake. You didn't buy a Range Rover like some do? No. Okay. Because that is. Because I found that it's one of the biggest um, consumers of, yes. of profits and. Yes. And but those are the profits. most crucial. The first months are the most crucial months in getting to mm -hmm. establish yourself and put your. So what name were you doing there? with that money initially? I was traveling and buying clothes and wigs and mm -hmm. yes now what Which are you was doing? a mistake okay how long you took you to realize this is a mistake and what are you doing i think now? about four or five months mm -hmm. that's a long time so how, what are you doing now now i'm reinvesting the money i'm getting i'm making sure that i put it onto marketing i pay forward you know my rents and everything mm. yes are you not traveling anymore not as much as I was when mm. I first started. Okay. Yes. All right. I won't, I won't pursue that one any further. Thank you. <laughs> What's the mission for Penny Properties? Um, the mission is to, is to provide solutions mm -hmm. to the buyers and sellers and other stakeholders that we're dealing with. So... The mission is to help is to help them in their transitions. You know, those people come to us with their heartaches. Some come to us with divorce problems, some come to us with death, some come to us with whatever reasons. Some most people are always selling with you know Emotional not coming burden. from yes, not coming from a good place. Mm. So they're always selling with emotional baggage. Mm. So we try and be a go-to point. Mm. Yes. Do you think that the, is this business of counseling people through their emotional problems should be taught at universities as part of the curriculum? Because it's, so, it's such an important part of the work. You know, most things that they teach at the university, we don't apply. Most things we just learn in the market. So being able to, to, be, to, to guide someone and bring them to a more stable or soothing you know, atmosphere is not taught. Mm. Yes. I don't think you can actually, you know, people respond to different programs in different ways, of course, but... Most times, it's not taught. You're talking it's, about emotional intelligence. Yes, it's within. So it depends on how you interact with people, how you are able to talk to people, and how you are able to address situations mm. before you. Okay, you have a different vision from the mission. What is the difference and what is the vision? 
Um, vision is more of long term. So the aim there is really to is to build a legacy, you know, so that I'm remembered in ten times decades, like in a hundred years, say. They'll be still be talking about Penny. Yes, that's um, the aim. Mm. Yes. Of course, I would have handed over to my children and my children's children, mm. but the aim is to be remembered. The aim is to be, is to be relevant even after a hundred years. Yeah, which leads to the next question. What is the legacy then you want to create uh, with which you want to be remembered? I, I want to be one of the top three that comes to everybody's mind when they think real estate. Yes. How are you going to achieve that? Um, marketing, first off. I am, I am going to be vigorous on my marketing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Such right. that even if you don't want to see me, you see me. Which is why you've come to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And, and in that context, who do you look up to? Who are your heroes or heroes in the real estate uh, field? Um, I would say MG because she's a woman like myself and she has made MG it in the industry. Gobe? MG Properties. Yeah, MG Properties. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Because she's made it. Yes, before. Is there any particular trait you see in her that you want to copy? She's out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, she has done very well for herself, and I aim to surpass that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm sure she will be happy to hear that. I hope so. Yeah. Yes. What about Pam Golding? I've heard so much about that one. Uh, Pam Golding is actually doing very well as well. I think they were rated once as one of the best-selling agents in Botswana when it comes to high-end properties. Do you I think aspire to be like that. that? Of course. Mm -hmm. like, the aim is to be remembered in a okay. hundred years. So mm -hmm. in order for me to do that, I'll have to close bigger deals. Okay. Yes. And as it happens... Uh, are there any heroes out there, any other people you look up to beyond these two women? Um, I would say just them at the moment. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, um, what is your advice on first-time buyers? Is it the same one you've given already or there's more? It's actually the same one I've given already. Okay. Yes. Because it, 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 yes, it's really a, the message it. Of, of being careful. Yes. All right. Now let's let's end our conversation with um, uh, the crystal ball issue. It's tied to the legacy. What exactly do you think will be in shape fifteen years from now, insofar as Penny Property is concerned, insofar as your personal brand is concerned? Um, in fifteen years from mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. I'll be as big as almost Absa. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. Even if you haven't worked with me, you will know of me. Mm -hmm. That's the aim. Okay. Yes. And um, how big will be the company? How many employees? Which parts of the world will it be operating? Uh, at the moment, we're, in, we're only in Khaborone, but the aim is to have two branches, Khaborone and Francistown. Mm. And then the Francistown one could, will cover other areas on the northern and upstairs on Okay. Kasani and other areas. Let me ask you a question I always ask uh, people in the property field. Okay. Buy and hold versus buy and sell. In other words, buy and hold versus flipping. Which one is a pre preferable strategy for growth and long-term success? Um, I would say both, actually. Because when you buy and hold you get to have a better portfolio and when you go to the banks you are able to leverage something and when you flip you it helps you create more income it's it's more 
profitable than buying and holding mm -hmm. in the short run. Long run, buy and hold, short run, flip. Mm -hmm. So it will actually depend on, like from individual to individual, on what your preference is. But doing a bit of both is actually... Even long term? Yes. Mm -hmm. You should have something that you hold on to, mm -hmm. an investment property that you hold on to, and then gamble with the rest. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, very interesting outlook, eh? Because me, I'm a solid buy and hold guy. Yeah, a solid buy and hold guy. Mm. And you sh do you not ask yourself why the property developers are doing very well while they're flipping? Because those are flippers. They build and sell mostly. Mm. And they are doing well. Some. Mm. Okay. Most, most of them are doing uh, <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, we'll have that debate. Um, Let's talk about React and Real. Are you a member of both? Yes, I am. On okay. all three categories. Namely? Estate agency, property valuation and management. Wow. If there's anything that you think needs to be done to improve those organizations, what do you think it is? Um, I'll say... I'll say... They need to actually look more into cutting back on chasing the little guys, mm -hmm. the fly-by-nights, and actually concentrate on helping us agents do better. You mm -hmm. know, they need to revise the fees because... There's a lot we can cash out on. You know, you can cash out on, like other companies are cashing out on viewings. There's a fee for just going to see a property. So they should introduce more ways of us getting to cash out, mm. you know, than just always having to chase the little guys. Of course, then, Five and are not the little guys, but mm. they take... Some. Some are big. They, they, they take a very big pie, mm. almost 50-50, mm -hmm. as the registered agents. Okay, I think so. there's provision for, what, 500,000 if somebody's caught? Has anybody been... It's, I think it's 50,000. You 50, mean the penalty for... Yes. It's 50,000 or three years imprisonment. Have they ever implemented which is, that? Which is very... It's nothing, really. So, I mean... Not get Three registered. Years is a lot. It's it's a choice between you pay you either pay the fifty thousand or you get three years imprisonment. But then you're also blacklisted, isn't it? But you you can't blacklist a fly by night. Mm -hmm, okay. Yes. So they they make money. So they do that knowing that they are able to they're able to pay back the fifty thousand. Mm. I mean, you catch a fly by night, you make them pay 50000 they go back onto the market, they do the same thing. It doesn't I mean, stop. Yeah. It doesn't stop. Mm. And but at least you're making 50000 a pop. More than 50000 mm. So, I mean, they, they I mean, the React is making 50000 each time. Yeah, but it's, it's really nothing. Okay. Yes, they should be looking on to... So Helping why don't you engage them? Why don't you make suggestions to them or even uh, become an office holder? With time, I will. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm just focused on Setting my up. growing, growing business. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. All right. Now, this is the part of the show where you get to hit me with a question. Do you have a question for me? Um, let's see. Uh... Oh, they didn't warn you that you were going to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. They did not, but... Um, <laughs> how did you become? Like, where did you start off? What risks did you take? That's like, three questions. On Which one should I ask? All of them. Mm. What risks did you... Oh, am I supposed to only ask one? One, yeah. You can ask. You can answer all of them. Mm -hmm. Please. You said, when did I start? When did you start? I started in 1991. Yeah, how did, no, how did you 
I actually saved, become. I, I deposited 100 pula in the account when I started the law firm with uh, Mr. Sokopolo. And it, I grew it from there to what it is now. Okay. But it's an attitude of being relentless with hard work, with getting good team members, just like you said, and being trying to be consistent and persistent. So I was very fortunate also to have on top of that grace from above. I've answered two. Which was the other one? Can I ask a different one? On the last one. Yes. Which one would you choose, hard work or consistency? There's no, there's no, um, that's a false choice. You need both. You have to work hard consistently. But then, of course, that hard work has to be smart as well. Targeted, intelligent, involve professionals. Uh, don't be a one-man show. So I'm lucky in that I've got a good team. Okay. Yeah. Now, right. this is the part of the show where now you look at that camera, madam. This one you're facing. Okay. And leave the viewer with something motivational based on what we've covered. Um, I'll give a message on life in general. So, I would say life is really about creating yourself and not finding yourself. So what you do, who you talk to, where you socialize, where you go, everything matters. That's it. Uh, what do you mean by not finding yourself? You know, uh, at church we're taught to find ourselves. And unfortunately, fortunately, most of us are raised in a, a Christian environment. environment. And that is the foundation we get when growing up. So, you create yourself. You decide who you want to be, and you work towards that. Mm -hmm. Would you care to share your, all your contacts on social media and elsewhere? Um, my social media names, Penyon Pizzi, so I'm really easy to find. And my contact is 72660558. Okay. And uh, you have a, uh, an address where they can go meet with you? Uh, my office is at Fairgrounds by Medical Muse, plot 50667, I think. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. That's, uh, you've been a great guest. You've shared generously. Thank you. And uh, you've been uh, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Mohobe. Mm -hmm.